I believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. The wait is over. It's finally here. After decades of making people across the country laugh. I was trying to write the word eulogy the other day, and my phone just kept going like, we haven't found any substitutes. Spell check. There's a picture of a guy with his pockets pulled out going, I, I don't know. And I- building a podcast empire. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice but to get on, man. Get it on. Adam Carolla has produced his very first stand-up special. In association with Chassis Media and Tug.com, Fascination Street Podcast presents Adam Carolla's Not Taco Bell Material. No one in my family knew what I was doing. They didn't have basic cable. Bad sign financially when you can't afford something that starts with the word basic. Wednesday, March 20th, 2019 in San Antonio, Texas. Tickets are $12, and you must buy your ticket in advance. We have to meet the pre-sale ticket threshold by March 12th, a week before the event. You can still buy tickets after March 12th, but we have to hit that threshold by March 12th for this event to take place on March 20th. I'm hosting. There will be giveaways of t-shirts, goodie bags, autographed books. All you got to do is show up and be ready to laugh. For ticket information, go to fascinationstreetpod.com Click on that portrait of Adam Carolla, and it'll take you straight to the place where you buy tickets. It's going to be fun. I'll see you there. Welcome back, Streetwalkers. This episode is with Evo Terra. I first became aware of Evo Terra when he started a little website called PatioBooks.com. Back in 2006, PatioBooks.com was a website that helped authors distribute their work in serialized audio recordings. Think of it as Audible, but before Audible, and for free. Evo's first episode of a podcast appeared on the Podcast Alley podcast directory back in October of 2004 and was only the 40th podcast added to that directory, making him a pioneer of the podcasting community. In this episode, we talk about how Evo got started into podcasting, why he started Patio Books, and we also talk about some of the books he's written, including Podcasting for Dummies and The Beer Diet. We also talk about his media company, Simpler Media Productions, and we talk about some of his previous podcasts, as well as his current podcast, which is a four times a week podcast called Podcast Pontifications, where Evo talks about some of the technology and some of the growth that's happening in the podcasting world. Enjoy, folks. This is the 40th podcaster ever, Evo Terra. Welcome to Fascination Street Podcast, Evo Terra. How are you doing this fine evening, sir? I'm a little chilly, but other than that, I think I'll make it. Thanks for inviting me on the show, Steve. Oh, my goodness. Evo Terra, you have no idea what you mean to me, how much you have changed my life. Wow. So, hold on. Let, let me open my beer here so that I can, uh, <laughs> so I can, you know, truly focus on the matters at hand. Okay, I see. <laughs> Do you drink alcohol? Uh, I have been known to drink alcohol on, on occasion. Yeah, yes, I do. Oh, okay, good. I just want to make sure you weren't like a, averse to me having a beverage while we talk. Yeah, 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 not at all. Uh, people who dig, you don't have to dig very far into my background to know that beer and podcasting were uh, the two things that propelled me to where I'm at today. Uh, I couldn't have done uh, where I, I couldn't be where I'm at right now if it wasn't for the combination of both beer and podcasting. Now, we'll get to that in a minute. All right. I assume you're talking about a very special and very specific diet. Well, there's that part of it as well. So, yes, yes, yes. Lots of things. Lots of things out there about me. Sweet. Mm. Well, then let's get started. Okay. So, back in 2000 and, I don't know, five, 
something like that. I got hired at a bank and I was on the uh, back side of a bank. So I was not customer facing. So I was basically just sitting at a computer all day yeah. and I could listen to whatever I wanted because like I said, I wasn't customer facing. So I could just have headphones on and listen to music or whatever. And mm-hmm. I got bored with listening to the same, I don't know, 11 songs all day. And somehow or another, I found patiobooks.com on the internet. Now, patiobooks.com, for those of you who are unaware, was or is, I'm not sure if it's still there. We'll get to that in a second. But uh, back then, it was sort of an aggregator, I want to say before even iTunes. I I certainly found it before iTunes, but it was an (laughs) aggregator for, um, I guess, serialized podcast fiction or yeah, something like that. Anyway, so like basically audible.com, but before them. <laughs> <laughs> that's close. That's a good That's a good remembrance. I'll, I'll take most of that. All right. So what I remember is that I want to say it was you, Evo Terra, and then yep. another person. Was there another yeah. person? Uh, I don't remember the name of that person. Um, it, it was a long time ago. So first, <laughs> did, did you start patiobooks.com? That is correct. I did start patiobooks.com back in 2005. So your dates are pretty darn close. Yeah, I did. Oh, that means I'm awesome. So (laughs) what propelled you to to make something like that? And then like that sounds so massive of an undertaking. How did all of that transpire? Well, I did it because I knew that you'd be sick of listening to the same seven Steely Dan songs over and over again, Steve. So I had to make something for you. That was one reason, but the the actual reason is – so at the time I'd been podcasting uh, – so I've been doing on internet radio stuff prior to podcasting. So for those that don't know, I'm the I'm the 40th podcaster ever. I wrote podcasting for dummies and I've been I've been doing this for a long time. Wait. And when I – yeah, sure. Are you – when you say the 40th podcaster ever, is that a legit yeah. title? Like Legit. Is, is that for real? For real. Yeah, yeah. Back in the day, prior to iTunes opening up and, and listing shows, which they started doing in uh, July of 2005, prior to that, we had a service called Podcast Alley that someone had put together, and it was where podcasters could go and, and list their show. And the show I was doing at the time called The Dragon Page, we were the 40th show listed on the platform. So therefore, 40th podcaster. That is outstanding. Yeah. Uh if that was me, that would be like that would be my Twitter handle, my email address. <laughs> I might even change my name legally to number forty. That is amazing. It was a we were in the right place at the right time uh, to to get things started. And and like I mentioned, so the, the radio show we had been doing it was an internet radio show. When we discovered podcasting, it was a quick little modification for us because we were already doing most of the work. We were already producing an MP3 file. We had a blog with an RSS feed. We just didn't have the enclosure tag, so we just hacked that together pretty quickly, and boom, we were podcasting. And so for us, it was just a continuation of that which we had been doing with the Dragon Page for two and a half years before that. And the show was – we interviewed authors. We interviewed science fiction authors on the program, big science fiction authors. Like I've interviewed Ray Bradbury. uh, I've interviewed Arthur C. Clarke. uh, That kind of level. And then also a lot of what I like to call underpublished authors, indie authors, whatever you want to call them. So I had become friends with lots of these people. And when I discovered podcasting, I started calling all the ones that I was friends with and said, there's this new thing called podcasting, struggling, underpublished author. There's something there for you. I don't exactly know what it is, but there's something. And one of those guys, T. Morris, that's probably the name you were trying to remember. T. Morris came to me and said, I got an idea, Evo. I want to release the book that I wrote a year or so ago as I'm going to narrate it one chapter at a time. And released it as a podcast. What do you think? And I said, I think that's a brilliant idea. And it was a couple of days after that that another guy named Mark Jeffrey called me. Another guy named Scott Sigler called me. All with the same idea. And so from that point there, I realized, okay, this is going to happen. And someone needs to wrangle all of this together. We need to call it something. Podcasted audiobooks. Pretty easy to make that into patio books. What if I started doing it? So I did. I reached out to another guy. Uh, actually, I, I put a call out on the radio show slash podcast I was doing called The Dragon Page that said everything I've just told you right now. I want to do this. I want to call it Patio Books, but I just need a developer to help me. And that night after the show published, I got an email from a guy named Chris Miller who said, I'll do it. And so me and T and Chris Miller formed a thing called patiobooks.com, which started out with whopping five titles on it. And, uh, and in its heyday, we had about 700 and ish, a little more than 700 titles. 
pushing out 2 million downloads every single month. It was awesome. So it was awesome. And you said was. Where yeah. Did, where did it go? What happened? Well, the world changed underneath this. you got to remember, when we started PatioBooks.com, there was no such thing as an Amazon Kindle. Really, the only way authors could get published back in 2005 was by getting a big agent and convincing one of the big publishers to pick their book up. That was number one. And, of course, that was something only available to the more elite, the top 1%, if you will where the other authors at the time were stuck with vanity publishing, self-publishing we call it today. But back in the day, it was more vanity publishing, where you, the author, would pay money to someone so that they would print your book, maybe 100 copies, and charge you like 15 bucks a pop for those, and you've got to pay for them out of your pocket, and you're walking up and down the street trying to sell your book. That was it. There weren't any other options. Yeah, there were ebooks, but there were no ebook readers at the time. Ebooks were largely a joke because no one had a consumption device with them. There really wasn't an option for self-publishers to do anything uh, without one of those other two options. So we looked at podcasting and said, well, that's an opportunity, right? If you, the author, instead of spending money, do you want to spend the 30, 50, 100 hours behind the microphone narrating your stuff and editing your stuff and putting it out? Because we can do all that for you for free. It won't cost you a dime. It'll just cost you a lot of time and effort to do that. So for many authors, for the first go around, for the first probably three or four years of existence, we were really one of a, a limited number of options that they had. It was the best way for them to go and try and build an audience and get people interested in them as an author so that maybe they had a shot at getting a publishing deal later on. So that's how it started. But then, as I mentioned, Audible, not Audible, Amazon.com came around and said, maybe we should sell something called a Kindle. And maybe we should make ebooks free or 99 cents. And so now the work they had already written, all the authors had gone through the trouble to write the story and edit the story and get it all done. Now they could just simply upload it, make it into an ebook. It was very simple and easy, a lot less effort to do. And the people were eating them up like crazy. So the demand dropped, to be really honest with you. And also the demand, and I don't mean the demand from a listener's perspective, because we still had lots and lots and lots of listeners, but the value equation for the author really was one of, do I want to spend a hundred hours doing this or do I want to spend five hours making an ebook and maybe getting people to buy it for 99 cents. So that's why after a while the world shifted. It was no longer about podcasting an audiobook. Podcasting moved to more of the mainstream audio fiction we're seeing today with full cast stuff and ongoing never ending stories. So it just changed a little bit. And um, because of that, in 2000, and I think it was 2016, we closed the the, the facing patiobooks.com. It actually got rolled into another company called Scribble, S-C-R-I-B-L. Yes. Sorry. And, uh, and all of, it's right. Yeah. And, and all of the books are still available. They're still listed on Apple podcast and other locations like that. Or you can go to scribble and search for all of them right there. So they're there. It's just, there's no longer a public face to patiobooks.com. So, um, are you part of scribble or are you done with all of that? I'm on the advisory council for Scribble. I still meet with them on a regular basis. I mean, I sold everything to them. So I'm still involved that way. But we're, the model is changing now. We still use, we Scribble still use a free podcast version of a book available when, when an author uploads an ebook and an audiobook to the platform and chooses to do something called crowd pricing everywhere, which means that we will publish the book everywhere and we've got a cool algorithm to figure out how much it should cost. But there's always a free version of that book available if they upload on an audiobook. And that free audiobook is available on all the outlets you're expecting them to be, you know, like Apple Podcasts and places like that. So, yes, I'm still involved with it, but on a now it's only as a part of the scribble publishing process as opposed to a separate standalone thing. Now, Evo, I'm not going to ask you for any numbers, and you don't have to say anything at all if you don't want to. But when you sold patio books to Scribble or whatever, did did yeah. you get a shiny penny? <laughs> uh, it, there was definitely a transaction that took place. Not enough for me to go retire and be fat and sassy for the rest of my life. None of that. But it it just kind of made sense for for what we did, and I'm uh, I'm I'm happy with the deal. So I guess I guess my question really was, was the amount you got worth the time and energy that you put into it? Uh, if I had gotten zero dollars, it was worth the time and energy I put into it. I loved every moment uh, that I spent working on patiobooks.com. And I usually would spend back in the day 20 to 30 hours a week. And I had a real job as well. 
but it would take me 20 to 30 hours a week just to keep up with the inflow of new content and keep the updates going. But I loved every single second of it and I wouldn't have changed it for a world. The only reason I, I decided to, to sell it, to roll it back into scribble to say that more uh, in a better way is that the demand on the supply side dropped. You know, the authors didn't need it anymore. They needed it for the longest time. And I was happy to, to serve in that, that capacity of, of scratching that itch. So I guess that is a very great example of if you see a, a hole, fill it, or if you, you know, cut, sort of a be the art you want to see in the world kind of a thing. Um, if that thing doesn't exist, create it. And so I, I, I cannot thank you enough. So besides the fact that audiobooks.com allowed me to not jump off of the top of the building <laughs> of the bank that I worked at, um, particularly in 2008 when the crisis happened and I got let go oh, yeah. from three different banks in nine months. <laughs> mm -hmm. Besides that, and beside the endless hours and hours of entertainment that your service provided, I have, you know, become friends with some of those authors that, yeah. that you know, first came on the scene. I am friends with Phil Rossi and Nathan oh, yeah. Lowell and Scott yeah. Sigler and Seth mm -hmm. Harwood. Three of those have actually been on this podcast already. I'm still working on Scott. He's He's a little busy. Um, He's a little busy. I was just talking to him today, as a matter of fact. <laughs> oh, my God. I love that man so much. He has killed me in his books. Oh, um, right on. Yeah. So he's killed me. Seth has killed me. <laughs> Phil, Phil Rossi. Oh, my gosh. He, you know, because you remember he makes music and soundtracks yeah. to go along with his fiction. So right. he actually recorded a version of the Fascination Street song by The Cure in sort of a uh, Nine Inch Nails techno kind of version. Nice. Um, so so that I could play it on my show. I mean, well, he actually says that he did it for the project he was working on at the time that I interviewed him. But mm -hmm. I feel like knowing that he was about to be on my show informed his song selection for that particular soundtrack. I think you can claim that. I, oh, I do claim that. And that is <laughs> so amazing. Like, The Cure did it great, but Phil Rossi did it so much better than The Cure. It is so good. Phil's talented, no doubt about that. No doubt. Okay, so thank you again for everything. You're like, welcome. Like, I, there's no way I would be doing what I'm doing right now or would have listened to the it's got to be 30,000 hours of podcasts <laughs> in general. Right. Um, so you really, really opened up a whole world of information, entertainment, and, you know, a hobby for me. So, so again, thank you for real. You're very welcome. I, I, I appreciate you saying that. I'm very happy to do it. Uh, it. It was because of that reaction you're giving me right there is why I did it. You know, it was immediately picked up by people. It was very appreciative. I'm, I'm, I can't thank the authors who decided to invest their time to, to do that level of work, especially all, all the guys you mentioned. And plus the other 500 people who, who said, yeah, this is, this is what I want to do. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have had the product to supply. And if it wasn't for people like you consuming it and enjoying it, there would have been no reason for them to just supply. I was, I was happy to be the middleman and make all those connections. Well, I'll tell you how long ago this was kids. I was using a Zune. <laughs> Yeah, the Zoom. It used to be the number two podcatcher back in the day. I think it got to around maybe 10% of market share before Microsoft did what Microsoft tends to do and closed it up. <laughs> oh, man, that made me so mad. I still have four Zooms, and those things are great because the storage capacity on those things beat the shit out of anything Apple had. And yeah. it was a lot more, I guess, user-friendly to me. I mean, I'm stupid, so... Uh, it, was, it was way easier for me to use. I never had a Zoom. Back in the day, the first thing I listened to when I got into podcasting, and as I wrote about in the, in the first few chapters of Podcasting for Dummies, when I explained to people that the name podcasting has nothing to do with the iPod. It's not where it came from. But when I was listening to podcasts, I didn't have an iPod. I didn't own one. I had an iRiver. Remember the iRiver? It was a little small tube about the size of a Rolaids. You know, a tube of, of, of things with uh, no user interface to speak of. It was a series of like Morse code and semaphores that you had to somehow get into this thing to add your music to it and then also to listen to things back. It was the craziest thing. I had one similar to that made by Sony, and it was about the size of sort of a small cigar. And like you said, there was no user interface. I mean, you right. plugged it in and you put whatever you wanted to on it, and then you yep. just, you basically had a, a 
track fast forward and a volume up and down. That's yeah. it. <laughs> it was very, very terrible tools we had back at the time. So much easier now. Oh my gosh, I feel like we had a hammer and chisel instead of a fountain <laughs> pen. I mean, it was crazy back then, back in the <laughs> olden days. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. I'm I'm giving a a talk at Podfest in Orlando in a few weeks, and one of my comments is talking about being an old man and podcasting and all that. But I'm I'm going to mention to them that they have no idea how good they have it today with all of the tools at their disposal to make and consume a show. Because we were making it up as we were going along until probably 2006, until finally we have some decent tools out there. But those first few years was pretty much the wild, wild west. We felt like we were on the Oregon Trail and we could die of dysentery at any moment. At every moment. (laughs) And also back then, they don't have it anymore and they only had it for a short time. But before I got into the Zune, Dell made their version called the Dell DJ. And that was, you know, a small handheld. It was pretty similar to about the size of a a current day cell phone. But Mm. um, instead of, you know how I guess Apple had that that wheel that you could spin in a circle with your thumb? Well, this was sort of a, instead of a a side by, uh, uh, instead of a, a circular wheel that goes, you know, left and right, this was a wheel that was an actual physical wheel (laughs) <laughs> that was embedded that you just scrolled up and down. Right. Um, oh, my goodness. And it was the screen was like LCD, just like, you know, liquid crystal display, mm-hmm. you know, like a, a just just black letters on a blank screen or what, like the dark ages. And now people listen on their watch. Isn't that which insane? Is, which is nuts. It's totally nuts. Yeah, it's been it has been great to watch this industry evolve over the last 15 years and see the massive changes that have taken place. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's all still people making content on one side and enjoying content on the other. And that's great. Well, it is my favorite thing that's happened with technology in the last 40 years. Wow. It has changed my life more than anything else, except maybe the stupid superconductor or whatever, the microchip, you know. Those things. <laughs> sure. Okay. Well, if it wasn't for microchip, we wouldn't have podcasting. <laughs> so I guess we got to pay do, you know, homage where it's due. I guess. I think they get enough homage. That's um, true. So yeah, as far as technology, I remember back in those days, like you said, when the Kindle first came out or when, you know, when it was getting, when it was, I guess also Barnes and Noble had one, I think called the Nook. Yeah, the Nook. Mm-hmm. So when those were coming out, I remember that some of the podcast fiction authors were pretty vocal about how dead tree versions were going to rule the world and nobody wants this stupid little weird e version thing. Uh, uh-huh. I'm not going to mention any names, but we both know who <laughs> was who was really at the vanguard of that. Mm. But uh, oh, and you know what's really funny is I still don't use a Kindle. I mean, I have one and there's yeah. things on it, but. I just really, really like a dead tree in my hand. I don't know why. Sure. Well, hey, you know that that's the great thing is we we shouldn't have to choose. I've made this argument many times. I've I've officially declared the the book versus ebook, and then the whatever the book is versus audiobook debates stupid. They make zero sense. Let people consume the content the way people want to consume the content. If that means you want to fold over. A paper book, if you want to buy a hardcover because you want a souvenir to have on your shelf and you like the smell of the way that print works, awesome. Most books should be available in both print book form and ebook form. I got no problem with that so ever. In fact, I think they should also be available in audiobook form for the people who want to consume it that way. So it's all about choice. The content creator doesn't care. You're, you're worrying about the container. Why are you worried about the container? You should worry about the content. Make amazing content. Let people consume it in whatever container they want. I could not agree more. So let's move away from patio books. I mean, I could talk for days just about how much that meant (laughs) to me and and the the things that I was able to hear and and the friends that I was able to make. So in lieu of that, let's move on. So you wrote a book called Podcasting for Dummies? Yeah, I did. When? I I wrote another book called... Expert Podcasting Practices for Dummies, which is arguably the worst book title ever. So the first edition of Podcasting for Dummies came out um, in 2005. 
like in November. And then expert podcasting practices for dummies, which no one bought, which is fine because I made them double my advance. I knew no one would buy that stupid book. Um, that came out like a couple of years later. And then also the second edition of podcasting for dummies came out not long after that. And then just recently, uh, the third edition, which I'm not a writer on it any longer. I, I ducked out halfway through uh, the, the expert podcasting practices for dummies. But the the third edition is out now. It just came out at the end of 2017, I think, is when it when it came out. And so it's m- nice and updated and all, all all of that that you want it. So if you need to learn how to write it, uh, my original co-author, T. Morris, who I also started PatioBooks.com with, T. has been the consistent voice through all of the For Dummies series. Uh, but the third edition was taken over by a good friend of mine named Chuck Tomasi, also a longtime podcaster as well. So very, very good book. Every time you say the name T. Morris, mm-hmm. I'm reminded of a word that is the word mo- Morevi. Is that a thing? Moravi. That was the first Moravi. book that T, T. That was the arguably, well, not arguably, that was definitively the very first patio book was Moravi. Oh, good. Well, yep. uh, that series of books was also awesome. Yeah, he uh, he he was it was his idea. I mean, to be really to give credit where credit is due, the idea of coming up with releasing the book in serial form was T's. I owe him with that concept. I own the name, damn it, because I'm the one that came up with it. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it was it was fun to do that. Kick ass. So you're still you have to still be friends with <clears throat> most, if not all, of these people, right? Oh yeah, yeah yeah yeah. We're we're still friends. I mean, I like I said, I I talked to Scott Sigler today. I haven't chatted with Phil in a while. We had an email exchange a com- couple of months ago. I visited uh, Nathan Lowell up at his place in Colorado. Um, I used to hang out with Seth Harwood when I would go to San Francisco. Um, so yeah, these 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 are not just acquaintances. For many of them, it is a, it is a true friendship that that is ongoing today. Of those people that we mentioned, I think. Well, I mean, I've got to hang out with Scott when he did like a, a book tour and a reading here in San Antonio, and we went and mm-hmm. we went and hung out and had some beers and watched soccer for some strange reason. <laughs> Must not have been a football game on. Well, I, he was really into soccer. I mean, I know he's into football, obviously, but for some reason, he was super into soccer. I think maybe it was the World Cup or some shit. Oh, probably. Yeah, yeah. He's a sports nut. There's no doubt. He knows more about sports than I could ever want to care about sports. Yeah, he does. He blows me away with his sports knowledge, but. Nathan Lowell, I did get to meet because he was at some sort of a podcast convention in Austin, and I drove up there oh, and, cool. and hung out with him and had a couple of drinks and you know did our interview and oh man, the nicest, nicest guy. All of those people that we have talked about are just the sweetest, nicest people. Yeah, super nice guys. It's really cool that you were able to help give them a platform that sort of you know. Not sort of, but 100% jumped off their career. So, yeah. Um, but I, I got to stop talking about patio books, man. I got to. <laughs> okay. So tell me about the beer diet. So I had a crazy idea. I have, I have a lot of crazy ideas. Clearly. And I, I, I tend to act on a lot of those crazy ideas. And so one of them was I, I was reading an article about a guy. I don't know him, but I was reading something. And this was, they had said that this guy decided that for Lent, one year, uh, he was going to do what he called the monk's diet. And he had a friend of his brew a special beer for him. And that's, this is what the guy was going to consume. That's it. Nothing else. No food, no drink. The only thing he was putting in his body for the, for Lent was this, this specially brewed beer. And I remember it was so funny because he said that he got so bored with it that he would have his wife, and this is not a dirty story. So just telling you this, he would have his wife massage his tongue with olive oil because he was so bored with the diet. And I'm reading that story, and I thought, that's dumb, because who could just drink one beer, one type of beer, for like 40 days? So that's insane. So I was chatting with some friends of mine. We get together on a regular basis and smoke cigars and drink beers and cocktails and that stuff. And I had mentioned it to him. One of them happened to be a, uh, he's a physician. And I said, I think I'd like to do something like that diet. But instead of doing it for Lent, which I shouldn't do anything for Lent. And also, instead of just doing one type of beer, I think I want to do it with a, a wide range of craft beer. What do you think? And he said, well, you know, you, you need protein because if you don't have protein in your diet, there's not enough protein in beer, your body's going to wind up eating its muscle tissue. So what if you did it with some sausage? And what if you did it in October? And we'll just do it the October best diet. And I said, you're a genius. And uh, we did it. And because this guy was a physician, I would go into his office at the beginning of the experiment for the month and the end of the experiment for the month, and as well as every single week. 
and get weighed in, get my vitals checked, and also get my blood tested. And we'd used it as an experiment. Let's find out what happens when a guy, at the time I was in my 40s, um, said, let's, why don't we just see what happens after this guy does nothing but eat sausages and drink beer as his entire caloric intake for the day, for 30 days, and let's just see what happens. Because we don't have a lot of data to, to figure what, what is a good idea and a bad idea. Let's give it a shot. And so I did. And the beer diet was born from that. What year was this? I want to say 2010. I where, think that might have been it. Where does that fall in relation to supersize me? Oh, uh, around the same time. The reason I'm talking in a, in a loud voice all the way away from my microphone right now is I'm picking up a copy of the book right now to find out exactly when it was that I did this. So the book came out in 2013. So maybe it was 2012 when I did it. No, it had to be. I think it was 2010. I think it just took me three years to write it uh, because, you know, going back to the going back to the well was kind of hard. So, yeah, it was probably around the Super Size Me time. And I was trying to do the opposite of that. You know, Super Size Me was all about let's show you how bad – this food is for you. So I wanted to counter that. Not that I think that everybody should go eat as much McDonald's food as they want. I'm not suggesting that, but I wanted to find out, you know, what would happen if we did this idea of let's take the worst possible foods you can imagine, beer and nitrate laden sausage. And what if we did that, but moderated our calories, moderated the amount of the amount that goes in. Let's find out what happens. Would it be, would I be healthier? Would I be skinnier? Would I be fatter? Would I be sicker? What would actually happen at the end of that? That was the whole experiment. Let's see if uh, we can do a diet based on the worst food for you. Well, the fact that you're still alive tells us that maybe nitrates and beer aren't as bad as we are, have been led to believe. But let's not spoil how the book ends. Everybody go buy that book. <laughs> What's it called? I am, I am not dead. It's called, oddly enough, The Beer Diet, A Brew Story. And is that available on Amazon? It's available everywhere you want to buy it. So, yep, exactly. It's written by me. It's basically a chronicle. I logged everything. Usually the next day, sometimes those are incoherent uh, because it was the next day after a Friday night. And also my doctor, Dr. Terry Simpson, uh, also a good friend of mine, he's also the co-author. and He writes uh, some in-between chapter information to, to let you know more scientific, scientifically about how, what's happening to my body and what's happening when we diet in general. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Everybody go check that book out. And when you do, click through the Amazon link on my website and buy that book. That helps yeah. me out and it helps Evo out. Plus, it's going to be super entertaining because that's <laughs> all Evo does. <laughs> that's my job. Okay. So you mentioned that uh, this gentleman that you got the idea from, uh, this beer monk fellow. Um, <laughs> right. You said he got his wife to massage his tongue with olive oil. I'm not kidding. Now- I have been happily married for 17 years, and my wife will do anything for me. She would carry me as a Sherpa up Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. However, there is no fucking way she would massage my tongue with olive oil. So I want to know from that weirdo, A, where he even came up with that idea, and two, how in the hell did he get his wife to do that? Steve, have you ever asked your wife if she'll do that? You know what? That's a really good point. I think you should give it a shot. Hmm. I feel like that should be a uh, something I record because that reaction <laughs> is going to be priceless. Somehow you got to surreptitiously put a microphone involved with that and uh, and yeah, say, honey, I got a strange request for you. Do it. Do it at night. Do it like, you know, like right before bed and say, honey, I got something. I want you to do something that's. It's a little weird. And that way she's already prepped and primed, right? She thinks, oh, man, what is this dude going to ask me now? And then lay on that. I want you to massage my tongue with olive oil. Oh, I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> I'm just right now trying to imagine her reaction. And I don't come out very well at the end of this in my imagination. <laughs> Like I might need some uh, some medical attention after I ask her this she can, question. She can only say no and then smack you in the balls. Yeah, there you go. I was like, only say no. Have you ever been married? <laughs> yeah, about 30 years. <laughs> oh, God. congratulations. Thank you. So I heard about this thing I want to try. Right now? Maybe. <laughs> no. It's a little weird. <laughs> We're not doing it. <laughs> Did you, uh... Did you, Bob, you, your phone. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> would you rub, uh, olive oil on my tongue? With my what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so tell me about, I could be wrong, but I feel okay. like you used to live in Bangkok, Thailand. I did, yeah, yeah. In in 2015, I'll, I'll give the very short version, and you can decide if you want to go longer or not. So in 2000 and late 2014, my wife and I decided to have a shared midlife crisis together, and we sold literally everything that we owned. We sold our furniture. We sold our couch houches. We sold our car. We didn't have any property at the time. We had a tiny little five by five storage unit that we kept. That kept our kids' baby pictures and some, you know, things like that. Things that are irreplaceable memories because you need that kind of stuff eventually. And we took off. We went travel the world. So we spent uh, the first year just traveling. We we left America uh, at the beginning of January 2015 with a one way ticket to France. And from there, we wound up going to 13 different countries across three different continents, wound up in Australia at the end of 2015. And as planned, the money was running out. So we needed to go do something else in 2015. And neither of us wanted to move back to America. We wanted to keep the party going. So we went to Bangkok as a easy place to try out, see what could happen. And while we were there, my wife got picked up by the international school system and became before too terribly long, the principal of a private school in Bangkok, Thailand. And so for two and a half years, uh, we lived uh, as expats uh, in Thailand. It was great. Wow. So oddly enough, that's not the first time that that has come up on this show where somebody yeah. has basically sold all of their worldly possessions and traveled the globe. Like surprisingly, that has come up way too often. I don't think it's normal for it to so come would- up as much as it has. Would your wife be more into traveling the world with you for three years or massaging your tongue with olive oil? So that question has a very complicated answer because for the last five years, my wife has traveled for work. So she travels a lot. Oh, right. So uh, she probably would rather massage my tongue with olive oil than So you So you present that as a choice, honey. Option A is we go travel. Option B is massage my tongue with oil. <laughs> it just sounds so weird when you say it. Say it again. It, say probably, it, again. Probably, it probably feels weird when she <laughs> massages your tongue with oil. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Hey, streetwalkers. Well, you're not literally streetwalkers. But now that I've got your attention... I am Stephen O'Reilly, and I have a podcast called The Bar Star Podcast. And since you're listening to the Fascination Street Podcast, I think you should check out my show. It's just as interesting without all the famous people, because Steve has connections that I just do not have. But if you dig podcasts about music, working musicians, and other random shit that I decided to talk about, based around music, of course, because that's what I do... I am a working musician for the past 30 years, and you need to check out the Bar Star Podcast. You can get it wherever you get your podcast, on any platform, and make sure you check out barstarpodcast.com. Now back to the one and only Steve Owens and whatever the hell he was talking about. Okay, so so your, your Thailand and travel experience tells me three things about your relationship with your lovely wife. One, y'all had enough money to do that. And two, you both have an amazing sense of adventure. And three, she really, really, really loves you. Yeah, all, all three of those things. And the, the last two, more than you can possibly imagine. But the first one about money, that not didn't take that much. We had $25,000 is how much we had set aside to do this crazy one year adventure, 25 grand. That's it. To travel the world to 13 countries and three continents for an entire year, $25,000, which is, which is not, it's not nothing, but you know, it's 25 grand. It's so, really not that much. Do you have children? We do. We, uh, we, our son was 20, well, let's see, he's 27 now. So uh, yeah, when we left, he was like 24. So yeah. And are your parents and siblings still alive on both sides of your parents head? are still alive? And the great thing is that my wife and I are both the oldest of all of our siblings and our other younger siblings uh, who are much, much younger than we are, like you know, mine are mine are 14 and 15 years difference than me. And I think she's 12 with hers. Those siblings, our younger siblings are also much closer to our parents, both in relationship as well as proximity. 
So we weren't absconding any responsibilities that people in their late 40s typically have. So armed with that and that healthy sense of adventure that you mentioned and uh, with an amazing relationship to go try and do crazy things and with the time, I mean, we sold a car so that we could afford to do this. That was it. And, uh, And we did it. Well, that is outstanding. So what did your family think when you told them, hey, guess what? We just sold everything we own except for this little five by five with full of kid pictures and uh, we'll be seeing you. Well, you know, my family has known me for most of my life. And so (laughs) their reaction was, of course, you're doing this. What else would you do? That makes perfect sense. They have no idea what it is that I do anyhow. They <laughs> never understood my particular mode of, of making my way through the through the world. So they said, of course you're doing this. Yes, why not? That is hilarious. So <laughs> now, Evo Terra, I know that's not your real name. And so I will posit a question for you now. Would you like to reveal your real name or would you like to stick with Evo Terra? Well, Evo Terra is my real name in that the majority of the people on the planet know me as Evo Terra. It is not my legal name, but I guarantee you it's very real. It is actually on my checking account. So you could you can write a check to Evo Terra and I can cash it. So no that's shit. about as real as it gets. But it's not the name that I was born with, no. And I'm not afraid to reveal it. It's on my Wikipedia page. So my, my real name is Travis Unwin, but it's really weird when anybody other than my mom calls me that. Yeah, I have that same thing. My name is Stephen Christopher, and almost all of my family calls me Christopher, but none of my friends do. They all call me Steve. So it's really, it really takes you out of whatever you're doing. It makes you go, wait, what happened when somebody well, calls you that other name? And and I've, I'm used to this. I mean, I've changed my name a lot throughout the years, but when I got into the, dealing with these authors, many authors use a pen name. Right. And so I know them by their pen name and I often know their real name as well. Like I'll give you an example. Someone I'm sure that, you know, or remember from the, the times on patiobooks.com, J.C. Hutchins. Uh-huh. Right. You know that name. Seventh so, son. Yeah, exactly. So so J.C. is J.C. Everyone knows him as J.C., but he's Chris. The C stands for Chris. And so he is it's like it's like being Clark Kent versus Superman. Right. I mean, he puts on the J.C. persona when he's out and about, but he's just Chris. And the same thing. T. Morris, his name is Thomas. But nobody calls him that. And on T. And so, yeah, there's – so it, I, I slid into that. It was like, oh, I, these are my people. Everybody's got a, a different name. It's a real name because everybody knows him by that name. But it's not necessarily the same name that's on their birth certificate or their driver's license. Yeah, and like Scott Sigler, his real name is Future Dark Overlord. Right. See? Scott's got plenty of weird names. Yeah. But uh, there is that. Right there with you. I, I honestly thought JC's uh, name, his legal name was Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think he he liked to use that a lot as well. <laughs> I think that currently, if one had to describe your career, I think they would call you a digital strategist. Is that correct? Yes. And for the last, I mean, so that is true. I, I've been a digital strategist for a while now. I, I started working in, I guess you could call it IT, although it's really much more the marketing side. I have a CIS degree, but don't ask me to write any code. The last time I wrote code, the blink tag was still in existence. So I've done digital strategy for the longest time. But for the last few years, I have been slowly growing, and now I'm very seriously growing my agency that I run now. And it is a strategy firm, but we are 100% focused on, see if you can guess, podcasting. All of my clients are podcasters, and they're all businesses who want to get into podcasting but don't necessarily want to know the full ins and outs of how to be a podcaster. Much like most business owners don't know how to write HTML, CSS, and Java or anything like that, so they can't run their own websites, same deal. My clients just want to be the content provider. They don't want to handle the technical architecture underneath. So they hire me and my people to do all of that other work for them. So they basically just say, here's what I want on my podcast. Make it happen. Sometimes some do that. Uh, most of my clients, what I'm doing right now with them is my job is to take care of everything so that the only thing they have to do is sit down behind a microphone on occasion and talk everything else we take care of. Now, some do a little more, some do a little less, but yeah, exactly. They come to me and say, what do we need to do? We want to enter the podcasting space. And it's just like it was 10 years ago when businesses realized, oh, actually 20 years ago, they realized, you know, all these phone books are piling up. No one's taking them home because no one's actually using the yellow pages to look up businesses. They're doing this thing called the internet. I guess we need a website. Fast forward 20 years and it's the same thing with podcasting. Businesses realize that people want to hear from them, but they don't know what that means. 
and they don't want to go spend the time to read 300 pages of podcasting for dummies and learn it in and out, like you know, they've got businesses to run. So they'd much rather have a someone come in who knows the space in and out, can help them figure out what to say, how to say it, when to say it, and then take care of all the stuff on the back end to make it work. And so that's what you do. That's what my firm does. Exactly right. It's called Simpler Media Productions. And uh, yeah, that's that's what we do. Now, are you global or are you just America? Oh, I started this business when I was in Bangkok. So oh. I have clients in, uh, i got a client in Singapore. I've got clients in the UK. Uh, so yeah, kind of all over the place. I've worked with clients in Australia. I've worked with clients in Thailand. Most of my clients are US-based because that's where most of the podcast consumption is happening. But we work with clients in every square inch of the world. Now, I, I'm glad you mentioned that, um, that most of the podcast consumption is U.S.-based. I was interviewing a, a podcaster in Wolverhampton—I Wol, Wol, was Easy interviewing— for you to say. Yeah, no shit. Uh, Wolverhampton, England. Okay. And, you Probably know— Probably pronounced I, Cheshire, but go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I <laughs> love it. Actually, the people pronounce it— Wolf hamster, <laughs> like they say it all. Sure, up. I get it. Um, yeah. Anyway, I was asking him if you know podcasting was as popular over there on his side of the pond as it is over here, and he seemed to think that it it kind of was. Um, <laughs> and I I feel like it's probably more popular here, but you know he still has the same problems that we have when when anybody yeah. says what do you do and he says podcast they say what is that. Well, that's actually changing a lot. I've noticed that in the last year, that reaction ha has been much less. Because when I say that to people, I mean, when people say, what do you do for a living? There's always that, that squirmy moment, right, where you don't know how to answer it. I've got the perfect elevator pitch. I launch podcasts. That's it. That's all I say. And then, I, then it's back to them. And what used to happen when I say that is a lot of those, what's a podcast? But now I don't get that. Now I get, oh, I listen to podcasts probably nine out of ten times. Really? Yep. And that's because I think the cultural shift has happened. You know, we were, we were just on The Simpsons last week. You know, there's an entire episode done about podcasting. We're throughout movies. Radio stations are talking about listening to their podcast. Television people are talking about the podcast they were on. This, this has become in the cultural mindset. People don't understand what it means still. Regular people don't understand what it means to have a podcast because right now only something like 30, 35 percent of the population actively listen to podcasts, which, which sounds like a really low number until you realize that that's also the same percentage of people who are on Twitter. You don't have to explain Twitter to a lot of people. You might have to explain Twitter to a lot of people, but they know there's a thing called Twitter. So now people know there's this thing called podcasting. They may not know what it is. They may have never listened, but they're no longer totally – it's not the first time they've ever heard, heard that word in their life. Hooray for 2019 for doing that for us. To be fair, I think it was probably either 2014 or 2015 that did that for us, uh, and I say that because – that's when Saturday Night Live did a spoof on the serial podcast. Sure. And once that happened, people around me started going, oh, maybe I should check out what a podcast is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Know, that like, time in 2014 when serial hit the waves, that was that was one of the big inflection points. That was, that was the first non-Apple inflection point in podcasting when everybody – with air quotes around that, when everybody was suddenly made aware of this thing called podcasting because of this long form, uh, interesting crime situation happening that the people from This American Life put out. So yeah, we we definitely hats off to them. And you're right, that then sparked a lot of other spoofs, a lot of other interests, a lot of things that have happened. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're happy 2014 happened. But now five years later, almost five years later, because it was in October, you know, now they're, we're, we're in, in living in that post-serial world to where at least everyone's been exposed to the concept. Correct. Now, there's still those douchebags, <clears throat> the same kind of douchebags that say, I don't own a television. Oh, or yes. the same ones who go, oh, I, I've never heard of a podcast, but they're yes. just being dicks. So those <laughs> exactly right. will always exist. That is true. Yeah, I, 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 no reasonable person <laughs> has, who is under the age. Well, you know, people say, well, it's for kids. I'm saying, I'm 50 years old. It's not for kids. You know, um, it is for kids, but it's also for all of us out there. I have plenty of my friends who've been podcasting for 15 years and they started when they were 50. So they're 65 now. So it's not a, not a kid's thing. So yes, every reasonable person who has been out of their house for more than once in the last 10 years now knows what a podcast, at least they know about the term podcasting. Yes. Uh, reasonable. Reasonable. That's the key factor. A reasonable person. 
So this is a little bit of an odd question, but number 40, the 40th podcast ever, and now there's yeah. got to be over a million. 700,000 um, right now. 700,000. We've hopefully, I think it'll break a million by the end of the year. I love that you have these numbers at the ready. Like everybody might not notice, but you just rattled off that it was in October of 2014. Like you are very sure. specific. So good job. Yeah, I, <laughs> this is what I do. I kind of know this space. <laughs> well, that makes sense. How many podcasts are you currently subscribed to? 147. I didn't make that number up. That's how many I actually have in my in my list. I just went through it a couple of days ago. And part of that reason, though, is so I subscribe to every single one of my clients' podcasts. And the day it drops, uh, that morning, I'm usually up around 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning because I'm 50 and I can't sleep past that any longer. I automatically check to make sure that the file loaded properly, that it's the right file because not that I say I've accidentally put the wrong one up, but I have. I do all that. So I listen to all of my clients there. So there's a couple dozen right there. I run a group here in Phoenix that I'm running off to right after this interview with you. Uh, it's called I Love Podcasting in Phoenix and where I'm wrangling together all of the podcaster and a lot of the listeners and even the podcaster curious and we meet on a regular basis. So there's probably 50 of those that I'm subscribed to are podcasts that are produced here in Phoenix itself that I'm, I subscribe to to see what's going on. And then the rest are a mixture of things that I love and things that I've, you know, a lot of these are finished. I'm just hoping maybe there's another season coming out. Uh, but yeah, there is there is quite a lot th that I subscribe to. Now, you just said you're subscribed to 50 podcasts that are produced in Phoenix. Yeah. What are they about? A lot of different things. I mean, they're that, like anything. If you just did a random sampling, if you went through the directory on Apple Podcasts or Overcast or anywhere else you wanted to and just randomly pick 50 shows, they might be about marketing. They might be an educational based podcast. They might be, there's one called the double loop podcast, which is about forensics and, you know, analyzing fingerprints and all of that stuff. Some are about nothing. You know, a lot of podcasts are literally about nothing, just kind of rambly talks people want to do for themselves. It's kind of all over. Wow. And I sounds... bet you'd find the same thing. I mean, you're, you're in San Antonio, you know, which is a sizable city. So I bet you there are, there are 50 other, at least 50 other podcasts that are being produced right now in San Antonio. And some will be about the most bizarre things. Some will be about the most mundane things. Some might be about San Antonio itself, but there are other people in your town that are making podcasts. And you just don't know it. What? Yep. I really thought that in the, in the city that has 1.6 million people, uh, I was the only, <laughs> no, no, nobody ever thought that. Yeah, probably not. So, yeah. In fact, um, one of a, a, a longtime friend of mine, uh, listen, uh, Jennifer, she's in San Antonio. I think Lynette Radio, Lynette Young's her name. She's by Lynette, Lynette Radio. She was a little podcaster a long time ago. She's in San Antonio now. So, uh, yeah, you got, you got a rich population of podcasters in your town. You hear that, San Antonio? We're rich. In podcasters who have no money. I'm going to cut that part out. You hear that, San Antonio? We're rich. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I know that you have a thing to get to. So I what do. I want right now, uh, if you have the the time and the inclination, I would like for you to tell everybody where they can find you on social media and how to reach out to you w with your agency. And then also, I want you to talk about the current podcast that you have out right now called Podcast Pontifications. I know that's yeah. a lot, but go no. ahead. I can, I can fit all of those things in pretty simply. Let's, let's do it backwards. So I do a four times a week show every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at eight o'clock my time, which is currently Phoenix time. I produce a little nine, maybe 10 minute episode of a show called podcast pontifications. It's a pap, which means podcast about podcasting, but where most of the other paps out there are how to or reviews of existing podcasts. Mine is very much a forward look. What's coming on the horizon for podcasting? How can we be better at podcasting? Not, not a how to do something, but a here's what's coming down the pike that you need to be aware of. I want to make people think about what it means to have a podcast today and what it might mean to have a podcast tomorrow. So that's Podcast Pontifications, which you can find, oddly enough, at podcastpontifications.com. Of course, it's everywhere you want to listen to a podcast because that's what I do. Apple, Google, Spotify, you name it. It's available in all of those places. As far as where to get in touch with me, if you think, hey, I have a business and I want to start a podcast, go to podcastlaunch.pro. 
podcastlaunch.pro is my website where you can find out about the services that my company, Simpler Media, offers to all of our clients. And if you want to get in touch with me, I'm every social channel you can possibly imagine. Because spending time overseas, I have accounts on the weirdest things <laughs> because that's how people need to reach out to me. I'm just simply Evo Terra on most places. So Evo Terra on Twitter, Evo Terra on Facebook, Evo Terra everywhere else. You actually might want to look for me. I'm, I'm not that hard to find. Very cool. Now, you said something interesting. You said at the beginning of that that your podcast, Podcast Pontifications, talks sort of about what's on the horizon and what's coming as far as podcasting. Yeah. Yeah. And I must say that if anybody has their finger on the pulse of podcasting and what's coming, it's you. Well, thanks. That's what I'm trying to do. I, you know, I, um, I don't know how to predict the future, but I am pretty good at spotting trends and noticing holes in the market, as you mentioned earlier. And I, I think I, I don't know where things are going, but I, I know what needs to be done. And I've got enough connections in the industry to have a little bit of inside track. You're not going to make any money off of it. Sorry. Uh, but a little bit of an inside track of what's really happening. And, uh, and yeah, I, I try and share as much of that as I can with my audience uh, every, every week, or at least four times a week, which is great. Well done. I have listened to a few episodes and it is very, very, it, it is entertaining, but it's also super educational. Like if you are in the podcast world or have a podcast or even listen to podcasts, it's a really good avenue to sort of learn what's about to happen and the things that could happen and the things that kind of are happening. So I would encourage everybody to go check out podcast pontifications available everywhere. Thank you for the endorsement. Uh, you are most welcome. Are you on WeChat? I am on WeChat. I can't find you. Where are you? Um, you know what? On WeChat, I had to change my number because WeChat ties it to a SIM card, you, you know, to, to a certain phone number on a, on a device. So you know how many phone numbers I had while I was traveling? I mean, every time I went to a new country, I got a new phone number, right? Yeah. So my, unfortunately, it was tied to my old Thailand phone number. Which was plus six six three nine seven. Oh, no, no. So, and they will not allow you to reset it. So, I have a new one that I just set up like last week, and I don't think I've finalized the profile on WeChat yet. But I, I promise you, I am there. I just, I don't, I don't know exactly how to, how to find it just yet because I'm, I'm going through the, the, the fix. Gotcha, gotcha. Why are you on WeChat? What? Because Why it you? is one of the largest social media platforms on the planet. Well, this I understand, but you're an American. America's going to be on WeChat. Dare you? I'm trying to think out the <laughs> box, bro. All right. Now, make, that make being WeChat said, great again. I don't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Did you really just say that? That's amazing. <laughs> I, might, I, I might have. I might have. <laughs> oh, that is perfect. <laughs> All right. Um, one of the things that I that I think is really cool that I only recently, I guess, figured out is that for most podcasts. And the, the creators don't even know this, but for most podcasts that are available pretty much everywhere, if you just walk over to your little Amazon thing and you say, Alexa, play the podcast, whatever, it'll play. Yeah. That's amazing. It really is amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Tune in did that first. They were the company that chartered with Amazon to to make a, a custom skill to do that. Um, my, my show, Podcast Pontifications, is a flash briefing, so you can actually say that word. I'm not going to say it to make somebody's device freak out in the event that they're playing it on the speakers. But if you simply say, hey, you, the lady in the, in the can, add Podcast Pontifications to my flash briefings, boom, it'll be there. And when you do your good morning routine, she'll play you my sultry voice for about nine minutes, uh, four times a week. That is amazing. Now, is that available only because it's such a short podcast? Yeah, flash briefings need to be short. Um, in fact, mine's a little long. A flash briefing is ideally less than five minutes, and mine's right. closer to ten. Um, so it's not it's not the perfect fit, but it does work. It does work pretty well. That is super rad. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, it's very cool. And also, same thing on if you have a Google Home device. I just recently outfitted my place with mostly Google Home devices uh, because I'm also, and most podcasts as well, are inside of Google Podcasts, which they've decided to abandon. And I'm a little pissed off about that, but we're not going to talk about that today. Um, you can say the same thing. You can say, tell, hey, Google. Oh, shit. Now she's going to talk. Oh, she's okay. Um, and then you can say that again and say, play this podcast. and It'll probably go find it. My wife and I, whenever we don't want her to you know, react, we just call her the A word. 
<laughs> that makes sense. I like so this. we just say so I was I was talking to the A word yesterday or whatever. <laughs> um now everybody who wants to know what Evo was talking about when he said that Google is sort of abandoning their podcast platform, he, he does talk about that uh probably it was probably two weeks ago now on podcast pontifications. So definitely go check that out if you want to get more into that. Um I don't really think we have the time right now to do it. Right. Um but Evo Terra is there anything that we didn't talk about or I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about? Oh, man, there's there's so many layers of this onion, but I think we've peeled back more than enough to give people a, a nice taste or a, a waft of my onioniness. I don't know. It, it, we're my, I think I mixed my metaphor up there, but no. So thank you very much for uh, inviting me to be on the show, Steve. It was a pleasure to meet you know such a longtime fan of, of patiobooks.com and uh, glad to see that we uh, we remain connected today. Well, make no mistake about it. The next time I am going to be in the Phoenix area, uh, you can rest assured that this kid is going to reach out and see if I can't buy you a frosty beverage. That I can make happen. Thank you very much for that in advance. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I did have one other question about the, oh, sa- sure. about the sausage. Yes. So was that just sausage with no bun and no sauerkraut and no onions and peppers? Like, was it just sausage? So the... Typical idea was my when I was preparing my own meals at home, which I ate most of my meals on on my own, right? I, I made my own sausage. And yes, it was a sausage link. Usually two of those per day was about all that I had. However, if I was going out to eat and if it happened to come with sauerkraut and maybe some potatoes on the side, eh, I would just adjust the calorie count down a little bit for that. Gotcha. And was it any particular kind of sausage or were all sausages open for this uh, experiment? Listen, I took I took the term sausage uh, to new heights. If it was meat in a tube originally, that was sausage. So I had plenty of Jimmy Dean sausage in the morning, plenty of kielbasas. I had chorizo, you name it. If it was a sausage, it probably went in my mouth at least once during that month. Now, because you said all of that, this has to have the explicit rating. So thanks a lot. <laughs> Already talking about your, your wife massaging your tongue with oil. That wasn't bad enough. Now it's got to be uh, explicit times two. You got to let me know how that goes out for you, man. I I, I wish you the best of luck on your uh, your tongue massage. <laughs> and if and if she says no, I know a couple of spots in San Antonio that'll do that for you. I'm sure you do. <laughs> All right, Evo Terra, thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with me. I know that we had to reschedule this a few times on my end, so thank you for being super flexible and willing to work with me on that. You changed my life. Have a great day, Evo, and uh, thank you again so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Take it easy. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2014 album Intransigence. Used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is Apollo from the 2001 album Into the Known by the band Sapphire. Thanks for hanging out with us and getting to know a little bit about our guest. We'll see you next time on Fascination Street.